Hey, fabulous calculus students. Here we are on assignment 31, second day of continuity. And so let's just review. What's the three part, not three point, but three part definition of continuous at a point x equals c? Pause the video, write it down, don't look at your notes. Okay, so what should you have? First part, f of c exists. Second part, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. Right, and in order for that limit to exist, that implies that the limit as x approaches c from the positive side of f equals the limit as x approaches c from the negative side of f. Okay, and then finally, our third part is that f of c needs to equal the limit as x approaches c of f of x. Okay, so that's our three-part definition of continuity at the point. Great, I hope you remembered that. My guess is if you didn't try the homework, you did not remember that. And the test is coming up soon, so um, you gotta know this stuff. All right, how about continuity on A to B? Continuity on A to B. Well, we do continuity on A to B if f of x is continuous and we're going to say by observation on a to b. If that function is continuous, then we've got continuity on the open interval. Very straightforward. So let's not waste time with that one. Instead, let's say, how can we determine continuity on the closed interval a to b? Please pause the video and write down the three things we need to be continuous on the closed interval. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you said that f is continuous on the open interval from a to b, but then we had the endpoints to consider. So we need to say that f of a equals the limit as x approaches a from, we're coming from this side to the left endpoint, so that's from the positive side of f. And finally, we want to be continuous at the right endpoint, so f of b has to equal the limit as x approaches b, not from the positive side, but from the negative side. If this is b and our function looks, is coming in like that, can only come from the negative side. There, nothing exists on the positive side. Okay, so that's a little review of where we were. Now, let's talk about this. Here's g of x. g of x equals 3 minus x for x is less than 2, 1 for x equal to 2, x over 2 or x greater than 2. Okay, now my recommendation is before you answer any of these questions, you pause the video and you graph g of x. My first question is, what's the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of g of x? Now, that's see what I mean about really this is so much easier if I can look at a picture. So, graph that thing. Okay, one, two, three. At two, I have a value of one. For x values bigger than two, I have this. Now, if I plug a two in here, two over two is one. Open circle, but this fills that in. So I hear all of this. I'll graph this, and I know if I plug in a four, I get two. Okay? So this is this piece. Now, x equals 1 for 
uh, I'm sorry, x at x equals 2, f equals 1. So that fills in that hole. And then I have 3 minus x for x less than 2. So um, what's happening at 2? 3 minus 2 is, oh, 1. Okay. And so my function goes that way, and that's 0, 3. All right. So what's the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of g of x? As we approach 2 from the positive side, what's the value of the limit? That's right, that value is 1. These y values are going down, 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 and approaching the value of 1. How about the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side? What's that equal to? Well, as I come in from this direction, the y values are coming down, 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 and they are also approaching a value of 1. Nice. Okay. And... Um, what can we say about the limit as x approaches 2 on g of x? Well, I can say this limit is 1, this limit is 1, and so I say that limit exists and is equal to 1. And finally, we know that f is continuous at x equals 2. And we can say because the limit as x approaches 2 of f equals f of 2. Great. So that's all good and wonderful. But what if I remove this line from my piecewise function? Now my graph <coughs> has that. Does that change any of these answers? <coughs> well, the limit as I approach 2 from the positive side, still heading down to a y value of 1. The limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side, still heading to a y value of 1. So I'm going to say that the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is still 1. But f of 2 no longer exists. So I would say f is not continuous at x equals 2 because <coughs> f of 2 does not exist. Okay? Excellent. Nice. Now, I want to talk today about... Oh, someone actually uh, asked me about this. Um, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, but f of c does not exist. Someone asked me for what do these look like, okay? So the limit exists, but the point does not exist, and that's x equals c. That's the limit exists, but f of c does not exist. Now we could also have the point exists, f of c exists, but the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist. Okay, so the point exists, and the limit does not exist. Or, the point exists, but the limit does not exist. Okay, that's that kind of thing. And then the last one, the limit exists and the point exists, but the function is not continuous. Okay, so the limit exists, the point exists, limit exists, f of c exists, but the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not equal f of c, okay? Someone asked to see what those different situations look like because in uh, when you justify whether a function is continuous at a point or not, you, you know, will probably want to say, oh, look, even though the limit exists, the point doesn't exist, or even though the limit exists and the point exists, they're not equal to each other. So I think those are good pictures to be thinking about. All right, so... Today's big topic, continuous 
extensions or removable discontinuities. Okay, so continuous extensions. So here's what we mean by a continuous extension. Let's consider f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Okay, yeah, we'll take that out because that's what we're considering right now. Does this function have any discontinuities? Well, sure, we say. We know that x plus 1 x minus 1 over x minus 1, we have a whole at x equals 1. And a whole is a type of removable discontinuity. So I want to build a continuous extension for that removable discontinuity. You know, if I graph this function, My function looks like this. There's a hole there. Well, a continuous extension is kind of like a wad of chewing gum that you use to fill in the hole. I want to define f of x now as a piecewise function. And I want to say, okay, you can be x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 for all x values except 1, because that's where you're discontinuous. And for x equals 1, I need a lot of chewing gum to fill in the hole on this function. So how can I figure that out? Well, remember how we did x minus 1, x plus 1, and x minus 1 and canceled? Well, that's what's left over. If I plug in this point x equals 1 into this what's left over stuff, 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is my continuous extension. I'm extending f of x by saying, well, let's define f of x a little more. And I'm doing that to make f of x continuous. When I define f of x to equal 2 at x equals 1, suddenly what happens is, when I go back and look at this graph of f of x, here's our graph of f of x. There's 1, there's 2. This is f of x. f of x is not continuous at x equals 1. There's a hole. It's a removal discontinuity. Hey, I only need to define one additional point in order to have f of x be continuous at x equals 1. And what is that point? At x equals 1, I need a value of 2. Ta-da! Chewing gum fills in the hole every time. So we're going to be focused on building continuous extensions for functions. Okay. So will you build a continuous extension for f of x equals x to the third minus 1 over x minus 1. That's our function, and I'd like you to build a continuous extension for it so that f of x is always continuous. Okay, how'd that go? Did you get stuck? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Most students get stuck with this because they forget that that's the difference of cubes and a difference of cubes factors x minus 1, x squared plus x plus 1, and then we have our x minus 1. See, if you can't identify where the discontinuity is, the removal discontinuity is, you don't really get far in these problems. And for that reason, having good algebra skills can be helpful. Okay, so I know that I have a whole at x equals 1. And so I'm going to say, okay, f of x, you can be that for everything except 1. And when we get to x equals 1, you need to be defined as a certain y value that fills in the hole on f of x at x equals 1. Well, if we plug a 1 in here, that is what fills in our hole. So 
I guess what I'm trying to say is the limit as x approaches 1 of x to the third minus 1 over x minus 1 is equal to the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 1, x squared plus x plus 1 over x minus 1. Look, when I plug in 1, I'm still getting 0 over 0 in indeterminate form. But if I cancel those factors out, and now I ask the question, what's the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus x plus 1? Now I can do direct substitution, and I get 1 squared plus 1 plus 1, or 3. And that's how I find out the value of my continuous extension. It did require me to evaluate this limit. It did require me to factor that numerator. Okay, so how about this one? f of x equals sine 3x over x. I would like you to build a continuous extension for this function, which of course means that you have to figure out where this function has a discontinuity. It's not a factoring thing, is it? I'll give you a hint. x can't equal 0 because if I plug in a 0, I have sine of 0, which is 0 over 0. I have an indeterminate form. Okay. So what's the value? Well, we saw these problems on our second day of limits. The limit as x approaches 0 sine 3x over x. Remember, sine u over u as x approaches 0 is equal to 1, but I don't have a 3 down there. So what do I need to do? I need to multiply the denominator by 3. But then the top will be all sad that it didn't get multiplied by 3, so we have to multiply by 3 on top as well as on the bottom. So now I could write this as the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 3x over 3x. Okay? This, the limit of the constant, is the constant. And the limit of sine u over u as x heads to 0 is 1. So I know the value of this limit is 3. So my piece of chewing gum is 3 for x equal to 0. Starting to understand what we're talking about here, we're trying to fill in the hole on this function. We need to know the y value on this function. That means we need to know the limit of this function as x approaches the place where that function has a removable discontinuity. Okay, how about this one? Um f of x equals uh, x over sine 2x. Okay. Try that one. Welcome back. So, did you say, hey, x equals 0, you're going to be a problem. I agree, because if I plug in a 0 to these, I get 0 over 0, which is undefined. So, how, we do, how do we define f of x at x equals 0? Well, let's think about this. The limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine 2x well, I know the limit as x approaches 0 of u over sine u is going to be 1, but that means this 2x in here, I need a 2 up here. Well, if I multiply the top by 2, I also have to multiply the bottom by 2. So now I'm going to be considering this as the limit as x heads to 0 of 2x over sine 2x times the limit as x heads to 0 of 1 over 2, because that 2 is on the bottom. Well, this is 1, this is 1 half, so I get 1 half. And therefore, I'm going to define my f of x as 1 half. 
10x equals 0. Okay. How about this one? f of x equals x squared minus 9 over x minus 2. You know, I'm hoping that you're all back by now saying there is a non-removable discontinuity at x equals 2. I see a vertical asymptote and therefore an infinite discontinuity at x equals 2. So no continuous extension is possible. I can only write a continuous extension if the function has a removable discontinuity. If I have an infinite discontinuity, a jump discontinuity, an oscillating discontinuity, yeah, no, can't fix that. I can't make this function continuous at x equals 2 because of the uh, infinite discontinuity that's there. Okay, so what about this one? f of x equals x to the third minus 7x minus 6 over x squared minus 9. Okay, let's say they put this on the calculator portion of the AP exam. How can you figure out any um, removal discontinuity so you can write continuous extensions for them? That's my question for you. Well, um, you know, when we were in pre-cal, uh, we reviewed how to factor we said x minus 2, x minus 3, and x plus 3. But in order for there to be a removal discontinuity, we need to be able to cancel out factor on top and on the bottom. Well, how can I figure out if this has any factors in common with factors in the denominator? You know, I've got a couple of ways I can do it. First, I could try 3, 1, 0, negative 7, negative 6. Hey, don't forget the zero placeholder. 1, 3, 3, 9, 2, 6, 0. Ah, so x minus 3 is a factor. And then I can factor this as x plus 1 and x plus 2. But remember how I said that this you could have calculator for this? Well, if I graph the numerator, x to the third minus 7x minus 6. Just graph the numerator on a standard viewing window. And look, there's negative 1, negative 2, and positive 3. Negative 1, negative 2, positive 3 are the zeros of that function. So that's what you'd be looking for on a graphing calculator. But some way you need to get that thing factored so that you can identify, aha, I have a removable discontinuity of 3. I have a non-removable infinite discontinuity at negative 3, and I'm never going to be able to fix that. But I could write, so let's actually list that. We have a removable discontinuity at, at x equals 3, and, and, and a non-removable infinite discontinuity at x equals negative 3. So we can build a continuous extension, but only 
to make f continuous at x equals 3. You can never fix x equals negative 3. So x to the third minus 7x minus 6 over x squared minus 9 will work for x values not equal to plus or minus 3. And then what's the value of this function at x equals 3? Oh, goodness. So x minus 3, x plus 1, x plus 2 over x minus 3, x plus 3. And now I want to know the limit as x approaches 3. So I cross those out, and I plug my 3s in. 3 plus 1 is 4, 3 plus 2 is 5, 4 times 5 is 20 on top, and 3 plus 3 is 6, so 10 thirds for x equals 3. And I'm just not going to be able to do f and e made continuous at x equals negative 3 because it's a non-removable discontinuity. Okay, so there's one last thing I want to talk about. Oh, oh no, there's two more. Okay, well, we're getting there. Um, okay, so... Theorem 7. So here's the thing. You're supposed to actually be reading the textbook. I've scanned the pages from the textbook. There's Theorem 7. You're supposed to know what Theorem 7 says. Now, Theorem 7 is only Theorem 7 in our textbook. It's not going to be Theorem 7 in someone else's textbook. So you don't have to remember so much the name Theorem 7, but you do have to remember um, what Theorem 7 says, and it says this. If f is continuous at x equals c and g is continuous at uh, x equals f of c, then g of f of c, uh, g of f of x, is continuous at x equals c. And so what we're talking about here is if you see a composition of functions, how do you know if that composition of functions is continuous at a given point? And the way that breaks down is you say, okay, the innermost function is continuous at that input. But then that input goes into the function, and now you need that inside function, you need the g to be continuous at that y value. So the inside function is going to take this in and we need the inside function to be continuous at that point. But the inside function, having eaten x equals c, is going to poop out this y value, f of c. That's the place where g needs to be continuous. g needs to be continuous at f of c, at that x value, in order for g of f of x to be continuous at x equals c. So let's see what we can do here to give you an example of what I'm ranting about. Um, show that sine x, x sine x over x squared plus 2 is continuous. In fact, I want the absolute value. Okay, so now I'm identifying two functions. I'm identifying g of x being the absolute value of x. And I'm identifying f of x as x sine x over x squared plus 2. And so what I'm looking at here is g of 
f of x. So what we need to know is f of x continuous. Well, yes, f of x is continuous. Now, how can I say that so blithely? Well, I'm looking for any restricted domains. y equals x doesn't have a restricted domain. Sine x doesn't have a restricted domain. This polynomial, x squared plus 2, does not have a restricted domain. I can plug any x value I want into this, and I'll get a y value out. Okay, so with that in mind, now I'm looking here and I say, oh, but wait, that's a denominator. I can't have a denominator equal to zero. That would be a restriction. Right? So, but no, that's not going to be a problem, is it? Because x squared plus 2 is never equal to zero. This is always positive. So I can say that f is continuous on negative infinity to infinity. Now, what are the outputs of this function? Yeah, what does this function poop out? Well, this function poops out lots of different numbers. Uh, I know that sine x only goes between negative 1 and 1, but x could be negative infinity to positive infinity. And yeah, so I, I'm going to get all the different y values out of this, I believe. Let's see if we can take a look at the graph, just to reassure some people. OK, parentheses x, sine x, divided by x squared plus 2, and zoom slow. Hmm. I was expecting a little more variation there. Is it because I'm dividing by this and this power is so much bigger than that? Oh, okay. So is it just one and negative one? I'm gonna change my range. I'm gonna go negative 100 to 100 in steps of 10, but I'm gonna change these to go negative one to one. Yep. So it looks like 1 and negative 1 uh, might be the highest. Let's see what happens at 0. I get a value of 0. Well, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting something higher. God, that looks awful, doesn't it? OK. So I know that what's going to come out of here is going to be either a negative number or a positive number. Good. Is g of x continuous if I plug in negative numbers? Sure. Is g of x continuous if I plug in positive numbers? Sure. So because g uh, is continuous for all, for all uh, f of x, we know that g of f of x is continuous. God, that feels horrible. So let me try again. OK. The inside function has to be continuous based on the x values I plug in. But the outside function has to be continuous for what the inside function poops out. This inside function will eat all these x's, great, but is going to poop a bunch of stuff out. And we need to know that g will be continuous for all that poop. Uh, and the answer here is yes. This poops out positive numbers and negative numbers, and this is continuous for positive numbers and for negative numbers. So we know that this composition is continuous. OK. The last thing I want to talk about has absolutely nothing to do with continuity. Well, except in the first sentence. I want to introduce you to the intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem, OK? So uh, the intermediate value theorem says if 
y equals f of x is continuous on closed interval a to b, then, hey, by the way, these preconditions, two years ago, AP started making all students responsible, not just for knowing what the theorem says, but also for knowing uh, what the preconditions of the theorem are. So continuous on the closed interval is our precondition for the intermediate value theorem. And by the way, theorem seven, Continuous compos uh, function, uh, composition of functions is continuous theorem. Yeah, I've never seen that on the AP exam. But IBT, oh, almost every year. So here's how IBT works. If y equals f of x is continuous on the closed interval, then, and here's our then, then y will, y will, then f of x will take on every y value from f of a to f of b. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means this. Let's imagine you have this point here and this point here. So you have a comma f of a, and you have b comma f of b. Now what I want you to do is to imagine a curve, and Max, you're going to be really good at this, imagine a curve, a function, a line connecting those two points. Okay, And I'm willing to bet <coughs> that most of you did this, but I'm also willing to bet that Max did something like this. And that's cool too. So what does the intermediate value theorem say to me? Well, the intermediate value theorem says that if this function is continuous, the red one, the green one, if this function is continuous, and we're going to have to show that we meet that precondition, if the function is continuous, then we need to pass through all the y values from this y value to this y value. All the y values get covered in between these two y values. Now, we don't know anything about Max's points up here or these points down here, but we do know that from this y value to this y value, if f of x is continuous, then that function must pass through all those y values. Okay. That's what IBT says. Oh, by the way, you can abbreviate this IBT because it shows up so often on the AP exam. It's got an abbreviation. So how does this get used? What do we do with IBT? Well, um, show or prove better. Prove. No, I like show. It's a little less intense. Show that f of x equals x to the third minus 3x squared plus 4x plus 3 has an x-intercept on um, negative 1 to 0. Okay? And I'm like, well, without a calculator, how the hell am I supposed to do that? Well, I'm going to use IVT here, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, hey, I wonder what f of negative 1 is. Okay, f of negative 1. And by the way, I'm going to use synthetic substitution because it's just that fast. 1, negative 1, negative 4, 4, 8, negative 8, negative 5. So that's negative 5. And what about f of 0? Well, f of 0 is 3. Now, what does IBT say? If f of x is continuous, hey, that's polynomial function. Polynomial functions are always continuous. So I'm going to say, since f of x is continuous, oh, and I, if I really want, I can say on negative 1 to 0. But, you know, this f of x is continuous everywhere, so I could just leave it and drop the mic at continuous. Since f of x is continuous, then f must 
pass through all the y values from f of negative 1 equals negative 5 to f of 0 equals 3, which includes y equals 0. An x-intercept is y equal to 0. 0 is between this negative number and this positive number. Somewhere on negative 1 to 0, f of x has to have an x-intercept because the y value is going to be equal to 0. Why? Because f of 1 is a negative number, f of 0 is a positive number, and IBT says I must pass through all the values between these values since f of x is continuous. That's pretty powerful. Um, so that's the sort of thing that um, you uh, need to um, be responsible for. Um, now, if you struggle with it the first couple of times, that's fine. But when we get to April, you need to know the intermediate value theorem. And by the way, this class is fundamentally different than any other math class you've ever had, even last year's class, because it presupposes that you're not going to forget because not only will you need IBT on our semester exam, but you're going to need IBT next semester and on the AP exam. You have to own all of this all the time. Okay? Okay. But luckily, I know you're up to the challenge. So, get going to that homework and let me know if you have any questions. Take care, everyone.